Welcome to Sunday Night Prime. I'm Father Andrew Apostoli, member of the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal, and it's my pleasure to be your host for today's program. Before we get into that, remember, I'd like to remind you, if you have any questions, any comments, suggestions for programs, uh, please send them to sundaynightprime at ewtn.com. That's sundaynightprime at ewtn.com. Com. Well, may the Lord give you his peace, the greeting of St. Francis. And today we have a beautiful program. We're going to talk about the, the year that Pope Francis has given us called the Jubilee of Mercy. And to help us, we have someone who is, may be familiar to a lot of you. We're viewers of EWTN, and she's written a wonderful book on this topic. And I'd like to, it's my pleasure to introduce our very special guest, Joan Lewis, who is EWTN. Wow, I'm so excited to be here, Father. Okay, you are Rome, you are EWTN's Rome Bureau Chief. That's right. Okay, and also author of a wonderful book here, Joan. So it's a real pleasure to have you on the Well, program. it's a joy, because I do so much from Rome, as you know, so much television. To be in studio with you, whom I follow, is, is a great joy well, for me. Well, thank yeah. you. That's a, that's a, it's a real uh, joy to hear that, you know. And, um, uh, you know, let, let me just show you her book. We'll talk a little bit. We're going to talk about it through this program. A Holy Year in Rome, The Complete Pilgrim's Guide for the Jubilee of Mercy, you know. Uh, well, Joan, I'm sure a lot of our viewers know you, but there may be some who don't. Could you tell us a little bit about your background, especially your work in, with EWTN in Rome? Well, I am so blessed to be doing what I'm doing for EW, EWTN. I'm in my 11th year as the Rome Bureau Chief, but before that I worked many years at the Vatican, at the Vatican Information Service within the press office. So, And all those years of working for the Holy See for the Vatican, uh, it was like it was a foundation for what the Lord was going to let me do when I retired from, from the Vatican. And um, so I had those wonderful years of getting to know people that are helpful in, uh, to me in my work now, people that I have to interview, people that are going to give me information, whether it's for this book or, or the other programs I do mm -hmm. for EWTN. I think most people know me from, my blog is called Jones Rome, and I have done 59 videos, three or four minutes each, called Jones Rome, or in some cases, you'll love it, um, Jones Assisi. I did 14 little, you oh, know, snippets beautiful. up there, historical, obviously looks at the basilica mm -hmm. and the lives, the people, the town. Um, so that's, most people recognize when we come to Rome, I mean, I've had this happen in restaurants and everything else, you know, oh my heavens, it's Jones Rome. So <laughs> may, maybe I'll have to change my last name. Um, <laughs> but they know the video and they know my blog. So, and then I mm -hmm. also appear now, I think we're in our second year, um, twice a week, Mondays and Thursdays, I'm on the show At Home with Jim and Joy. And that airs like, I think it's 2 p.m. E, uh, East Coast time. And so I always bring some little snippet from Rome to the show because, uh, of course, it's marriage, it's family life, it's, it's pro-life issues. So whatever's happening in Rome or if the Pope has written something apropos of that day's topic, that's what I bring in our our live appearances from Rome. So mm -hmm. I'm a busy person because I also have three radio shows. Wow. Vatican Radio is called Joan Knows. And it, it doesn't have now the question and answer session, but the name was born when I used to give a news summary and then finish with a Q&A. Somebody would send in a question like you mentioned for yourself, mm -hmm. and then I would I would give the answer. And I have a weekly show on Wednesdays with Teresa Tamio, of course, oh, yes, that's it, sure yeah. So, yes. mm -hmm. and, um, and then I have the Vatican radio show, as I said, and my weekend radio show for EWTN is Vatican Insider. It has 25 minutes long, and 
news and a Q and A and and an interview with someone famous and interesting. <laughs> Very good. So yeah. I'm busy. What do you do in your spare time, John? <laughs> I cook. <laughs> That's I, ha one. I have a lot of friends. For Doug Kick once called me, introduced me on a program as EWTN's Realm Bureau Chief, and you know what? She's Rome's bureau chef, because everybody ends up at her house for dinner. Wow, so, that's great. Have you cooked a lot of Italian recipes there? I'm kind of all over all the over. place okay. with recipes, a little mm -hmm. bit of French. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm not quite gone into Chinese yet, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, probably a mixture of American and Italian, I would say. Uh -huh. The but, pasta, the yeah. antipasto. Yeah. See, I was raised on Italian food. You know, of my, course you were. My mother's maiden name was Carminucci, you know. Her specialty was pizza. She used to make a delicious oh. pizza. I used to I used to love to take the brothers and sisters to my my family, my parents' home, and I'd say, Mom, make some nice pizza for them. And one of the brothers was eating the pizza one day, and he said to my, mo my mother, he said, Mrs. Apostoli, how do you get this pizza to taste so good? And she said, I put a lot of love in it. So Aww, that was mom's special wonderful. recipe. She put that was her that was her real gift. Yeah. And you know, Joan, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. You know, you're mentioning being in, in uh, Rome, and I, I remember I had an experience around 1981. Uh, I was a Capuchin Franciscan at the time. We had this Franciscan heritage program, and I got over to Italy uh, for the first time. I was in Rome, you know, where I saw my roots as a Catholic. Of you know, then in Assisi, I saw my roots as a as a Franciscan. Franciscan, and then we ended up in a place called Camerino, which is in the marches of Ancona, where my family actually on the came Adriatic, from. yeah, on the Adriatic side, yes, and and that's where the Capuchin reform began. So it was like an experience of my roots, Catholic. Franciscan wow. Capuchin, you know, but it must be a wonderful thing, you know, being there, Joan. And, uh, you know, now what, what moved you to write th this beautiful book? Well, actually, for the whole year 2000, um, the current one we're in is an extraordinary jubilee of mercy. Yes. But the holy year 2000 was the 26th in what are known as ordinary jubilee years. And so I had written a small volume for that and some, some of the things that are in here, obviously the pilgrim basilicas, a, mm -hmm. a history of jubilees and so forth. And so, so I had kind of that, the basics, the, the foundation, if you will. So when the great papal surprise, which is the name of one of the chapters in the book, mm -hmm. when Pope Francis on March 13, 2015, which was the second anniversary of his papacy, but it was during a prayer event in St. Peter's Basilica, when the Pope said that I have thought of calling a jubilee of mercy, we know for two years we had heard nothing but the word mercy from him. Mm -hmm. That was the highlight, the, the one defining word of his, of his papacy. And so the fact that he called a holy year, I thought to myself, oh heavens, so much has happened between 2000 and 2016, 15, when of course December of last mm -hmm. year, when the jubilee began, I just thought I can, take all this information and update it, but take a look at Mercy, have a chapter on the papal surprise, the, the bull of indiction, the Pope's announcement, relative documents mm -hmm. to, to the Jubilee. Yes. And it was a lot of fun because there were, were so many new things that I could add to this volume. It's much bigger than, uh, than the previous one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, it was like how the Pope's just given the world a gift, a holy year, maybe I could give them a little gift to have with them during that holy year. Right. Yeah. To profit more. You know, I think, uh, Joan, when the people of God know why, you know, what the Pope has given us, what, are, what how we could respond best, right. they will profit so much more. Oh, you know? yes. Yeah. And, that, and that's the whole idea. And um, to profit also, you and I were talking about this earlier over lunch, the fact that uh, a, a jubilee is, n it might be focused on Rome. The Pope called it in Rome. There's big events that happen in Rome, but they bring people from all over the world to Rome. So the upcoming in, in the month of this month of May, the, the jubilee for deacons later this month, and then mm -hmm. next month, the jubilee for priests on the Feast of, I think it's the Sacred Heart. Um, there will be a jubilee of uh, young people, of course, World Youth Day, a jubilee for ill people. So we will have people from all over the world, from the Universal Church focus in Rome. But Francis really wanted to insist on the fact that this jubilee, this holy year should be held 
in every diocese. Mm -hmm. There should be minimum one, sometimes several, holy doors in each diocese because you don't want people to feel badly because they can't get on a plane and come to Rome. Yes. And, and actually, I have to tell you, one of the greatest compliments I've received from people who ha write me, having bought and read the book, was that, yes, we have Rome on the cover, um, we have St. Peter's Basilica, it is a holy year in Rome, but A, it's a good guidebook for a holy year anywhere. That's so right. we could call it a holy year in New York mm -hmm. or in Birmingham or, or wherever we might decide. And it's also a book that beyond the holy year, when it ends in November of this year, at the end of November, the Feast of Christ the King, when the holy year ends, there's so much in this that will still be of value. Absolutely. You know, to, the, oh, yes. to the reader, to anybody mm -hmm. who wants to travel to Rome or can't, you know. Mm -hmm. And so. you know, you, you see the Holy Spirit working, you know, uh, from, from Jubilee to Jubilee. You know, when I read your chapter on that, on the history, uh, we went, I don't want to get into that right now, but I wanted to ask you, um, you know, the Holy Father has this great focus on mercy. Yeah. Do, you think, uh, do you think the troubled times are provoking this? Uh, it, it sounds like, from what I started to read about Pope Francis, just as he became our new pope and so few of us knew his background, um, it sounds like mercy was a very big part of his life before he became pope. When you think of his concern for the disabled, his concern for the ill, mm -hmm. his concern for the homeless and the poor and the mm -hmm. outcasts, um, his concern for them, and, and mercy was just always a part of that. Mm -hmm. Also, his focus on God's love for us. I have to say, since Francis became Pope, I have personally, Joan, felt God's love more than at any other time in my life. Mm -hmm. Francis, for me, has made that very real. And when someone loves you like God loves us, m mercy also plays a big part in, in that love. Oh, yes, and, yes. and so that's what the, this has meant to me, the concentration on mercy. I do look at the poor, the outcasts, the homeless in Rome in a different way. This mm -hmm. Pope has made me walk by a homeless person begging on the streets of Rome and turn to them and smile and say buongiorno. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't used to do that. Mm. I would wa walk by them and, you know, they aren't a part of your life. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, you realize how much even a buongiorno, good morning, good day, could mean to a person who's sort of very alone, feels maybe unloved, unwelcomed, right. or, you know, sort of fending for themselves and how, you know, that's a, such a terrible suffering, isn't it, to be alone? Well, I even think more about why is this person, person there? We know for just in Rome alone, but we know that with many homeless people, there is a question of maybe a mental illness or something. Others, they really they were maybe in a good position and maybe had a family and a job. A and for circumstances well beyond their control, all of a sudden they end up losing everything. Yeah. And, um, mm -hmm. and, and maybe they can't make it up, get it back. Yeah. And so all of a sudden we see them in ragtag clothing and mm -hmm. having to beg. Yeah. So. You know, uh, in our community, uh, Joan, we have a couple of shelters. We had the Padre Pio shelter for a long time. Now we have the St. Anthony shelter, which is even bigger. And, you know, sometimes you do meet people. I remember a guy who was a lawyer. He was doing very well, but I guess maybe uh, right. he fell into, like, alcohol and things like that, which really undermined his sure. position. And yet he was a good person. And, uh, you know, you, you try to kind of get them to uh, get it together, you know, and, and that's mercy, to receive that mercy, encouraging them to be open to it, to ask the Lord for it because he's, oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, um, one of the great impacts on, my, on me over this same period of time that you're talking about, I've been reading the diary of St. Faustina. I am oh. heavily into that diary and I love it. You know, I, I just can sense because um, I teach the, a course on prayer and development and stages like St. Teresa of Avila talks about. Sure. You could see it right there as she's going through from stage to stage. And she, you know, great saint as she is. She had her doubts, she had her fears, and just like we all go through. And what encouragement and how Jesus spoke 
with such love and concern, you know. Oh, yes. Mercy for her. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Well, yeah. Joan, we're going to come to our first break in a okay. few moments now. And uh, so uh, we'll take a little break and we'll be, we'll be right back. Don't leave us. We have so many beautiful things to share. This book has got a treasure. So hold on. Welcome back to Sunday Night Crime. I'm Father Andrew Apostoli, your host for today's program. And our special guest is, is, is uh, Joan Lewis, who is EWTN's Rome Bureau Chief. She is also author of a wonderful book, A Holy Year in Rome, The Complete Pilgrim's Guide for the Jubilee of Mercy. Joan, again, welcome to the show, and uh, uh, thank you for writing this beautiful book. Tell us, what was a jubilee year? What does that mean? There's two origins to, to the word jubilee. We have the biblical word jobel, which means ram's horn. And this was a horn that was actually sounded every at the end of seven times seven years is 49. So the 50th year was a year of celebration. It was the repayment. Uh, all debts were done away with. Slaves were freed. And so it, it really was because of that, a time of celebration. Although the aspect I never understood of those jubilees was they would leave lands untilled for a long time. I, I never did explore that for my book, but maybe someday I will. But then, so we have that biblical account, and the number 50 was very important, as we will see for the mm -hmm. Catholic Jubilees. But then we have the word uh, jubilare, the, the Latin word, to rejoice, mm -hmm. to be happy. And we think of a jubilee, we can have a priestly jubilee, 25th, 50th anniversary, we can have wedding anniversaries. So uh, usually you'll think of jubilee, it could be silver, but usually is golden for mm -hmm. 50 years, right? 50, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to that biblical concept. And um, when the Jubilees, as we know them now, these official celebrations, they were actually started uh, by Pope Boniface VIII in the year 1300. And um, it's fascinating to see how they evolved over the years, and that was the fascinating part of studying and, and writing the book, because in the, he declared they would be held every 100 years. Well, how many people, you, there would be people who would go an entire lifetime, families, where maybe only every third generation would be able to go. Yes, yes. So then that was moved down to um, 50, and then eventually it became what it is today. Ordinary jubilees are every 25 years. Years. And then when a pope wants to, like for the redemption, 1983, John Paul had um, the extraordinary jubilee of the redemption. There was a Marian jubilee. And this, again, is the jubilee of mercy, is an extraordinary jubilee. So it's a time that en envelops many sensations, many ideas, many mm -hmm. feelings. We say jubilation and celebration and happiness. A and you, you've got the idea of reconciliation, reestablishing peace, reconciliation between a person and God, between two people, between families. Sure. Yeah. So there's many, so many positive things mm -hmm. in a jubilee. Mm -hmm. And then watching them develop o over history. And there were a couple of years in history where, because of wars, situations in Italy, when we had the Papal States, which was a great portion yeah. of central, uh, of what we today know as Italy, a great portion of um, the boot, Italy. Mm -hmm. And when um, those were confiscated and there were huge political problems within Italy, there was a it was one for sure, and I think two jubilees that were skipped, obviously, during a world war. Mm -hmm. um, there was certainly no reason for jubilation or, yeah. or anything. Mm -hmm. So, to, and, and what's really been fun over the years, studying the jubilees, but then also being in Rome in the 90s as they were preparing for the jubilee year 2000. In these, this year since Pope, the Pope announced the um, 
this current jubilee. It's interesting to watch how the church and how cities ready themselves. For so many years, centuries, of course, it was Rome, the focus of the Jubilees, but bridges being built or hospices to welcome pilgrims. Mm -hmm. The very hospital of Santo Spirito be, uh, started out as a hospice for pilgrims. Oh, Pil mm -hmm. Pilgrims used to walk to Rome from, from France, from Germany, the, the countries we call France and Germany today. Mm -hmm. And um, that'd be a treacherous trip. Many of them needed medical care when they got here. Sure, yeah. So a hospice, actually a resting place, became the hospital that we know today. And I think the doors were first open in something like 747 at today's hospital of the Holy Spirit, Santo wow. Spirito. Mm -hmm. And um, I have to interject for a minute because every time that I hear the name Santo Spirito, um, Holy Spirit Hospital, I think of um, Pope John the the twenty third. He was uh, hadn't been pope that long, and he was making a visit to various offices of the Roman Curia. And one day he decided that, uh, or he, I guess he had been invited to visit um, Holy Spirit Hospital. And so the nun who was in charge of the hospital came down to greet him, of course, and and she introduced herself and she said, "I'm the superior of the Holy Spirit," and he said. Well, I'm the vicar of Christ. Lucky you. <laughs> I'm only the vicar of Christ. But um, anyway, no. So going back to buildings and bridges and and whatever that that were built. Is that a great story? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, John certainly is one. Of, he's the first pope I ever saw, um, and I've spoken to four. I've seen five and spoken to four of those five. Wow. So it's great, great privilege. Starting John. with John. Oh, it is indeed. Yeah. And um, so John Paul the Sixth, um, John Paul the Second, Benedict, and now Francis. So mm -hmm. it's been very privileged years. And Father, I have to tell you, when people say, "Well, God bless you," I go, "He really has," yeah, Be because He has, you know. Yeah. In the life I've been privileged to lead or accept, maybe mm -hmm. from this gift from God, mm -hmm. and and work on it. Yeah. As a, as a journalist, a person in the media, getting the truth out, and telling stories. <laughs> yeah, also, very you know. good. Well, thank you for that. Your wonderful work there to um, uh, encourage people to take advantage of this year. You know, you mentioned the Holy Father being so focused on mercy. First of all, that I always say mercy is a gift we need to receive from God, but it's a, a gift that we in turn must give to our brothers and sisters, yes. you know, in the works of mercy, the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. But, you know, the Holy Father, so concerned with, I'm sure, the many people in the church who are no longer or have not been for a while uh, taking advantage of the beautiful sacrament of God's mercy and confession. Yes. And here, he, isn't he sending those missionaries of mercy out? Oh, he sent to, the missionaries he, out. And then what was it, about two weeks ago when he had all the other uh, teenagers? And in St. Peter's Square, it was on, this, on that Saturday. Uh, April 23rd, I think, um, he've got 70,000 teenagers in St. Peter's Square. A and all around the colonnade area and in the square were priests who were hearing confessions. And unannounced, the Holy Father came out and he heard the confessions of 16 y young people. Wow. And I was speaking to someone afterwards who was in the crowd, and they said it was so amazing when the Holy Father came out, people were like, oh, Oh my gosh, look, the Pope, he's hearing confessions. And um, th you could see people lined up to go to confession, and all of a sudden the priest that was seated in this one chair got up and the Pope sat down. And two or three people got out of line, <laughs> and others <laughs> rushed to get in line yeah, and, yeah. and to confess to the Holy Father. Yeah. But you know, like on Good Fridays, he's the first one to go and, and you know, go to confession yeah, and then can. hear them in yeah. St. Peter's Basilica. Yeah, that's so. a great example. I know uh, Pope John Paul, I remember years ago, he, he had done that and people were just taken, Yeah, you know. Well, it shows the importance of this beautiful sacrament. And, you know, when he gave the priests the power throughout the whole world to forgive sin, a sin like abortion, right. which is reserved to the to bishop. To the Holy See, you know, normally, and, yeah. yeah. And uh, you have to have special permission or here in the United States, we do have that. Uh, a power to absolve that sin. It was especially given a number of years ago. 
But he gave it to every priest throughout the whole world. Mm -hmm. And you know, there are so many people, Joan, that I'm sure burdened with that sin, want to get rid of it, but had to find a priest who could absolve them, you know? And the Pope, I think, was concerned. You got to make it, especially a person feels, I'm contrite, I want to be forgiven. But I, I can't get. You but know. I don't think I could be forgiven. That yeah. that's the whole thing. Yeah. And, and a lot of people actually thought they were excommunicated. And, and Pope Francis has been very clear about that. He has said it in interviews on planes after trips. He has written about it that you know you you were not excommunicated, and th- con- this is why we have confession reconciliation. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know if we'll ever know numbers from this year, probably not, but, no. but we may have an inkling. You may have priests come and say, wow, you know, I had double the number of people in confession. I've had 30 people come back to the church after years. So yeah. we may get some inkling of the yeah. blessings of confession. Yeah. See, we can't talk about that, uh, you know, because it's the seal, you got to be careful oh, how sure. much you say. But, you know, it is, I always say, it's the, the prerogative of a priest or, the, or at least the joy of a priest, when he hears confessions of people who have been away for a long time, they really come back contrite, peaceful now, joyful, with a feeling that an enormous burden was lifted from sure. them. He knows that in his heart. you know, And that's what I think Jesus meant when he said, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 who did not need to repent. They didn't have any serious things. And uh, I, I do think that Pope Francis has been very conscious of that. And uh, He talks about yeah. the church as a field hospital. Yeah, right. and, and we're out there not for the well, but for those people who need to be healed and cured. Yeah. And, and so that image is a very, very popular one. Right. He is making people realize the mercy of God, as, as St. Faustina says in her diary, it's incomprehensible. She said, the greatest angel in heaven the greatest saint cannot fathom the mercy of God. That's how great it is. So the Holy Father has given us this, and, and uh, thank you for reminding our people. You know, uh, you mentioned, uh, with, we wanted to look at some of the features of the Jubilee. Um, sometimes there were, not all the times, but sometimes uh, maybe a canonization or beatification. You mentioned some of those in your historical. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, even there were times one of the, when I look back at history, I give the history of Jubilees. And so this is the ordinary and then an extraordinary and the 25th, you know, ordinary. Mm-hmm. And, and then I fit the, uh, the Jubilees into an historical context, which is very interesting. Mm-hmm. So if you've got the Jubilee of the year 1425 or something, um, then what else was happening in the world in history, mostly Europe at that mm-hmm. time, a- at the same time? Or interesting facts like the first holy door to be opened was um, Pope Martin V, and that was on, on St. John Lateran, that was 1423. Mm-hmm. So um, ju- just the stories of holy doors in themselves mm-hmm. is a fascinating aspect yeah, of yeah. the Jubilees, yeah. the formal opening, because I do mention the seven churches that pilgrims, mm-hmm. uh, the seven pilgrim churches that yeah. a, uh, a pilgrim must go to, four of which are papal basilicas and the, the other three are not. But those are the four that have the holy doors mm-hmm. opened at the beginning and closed at the end in an amazing ceremony, a, a very astonishing mm-hmm. thing to watch. Just briefly, we, we only a few moments before right. we end this segment, uh, Joan, but what, what is the meaning of that door, that holy door? Why is it a door that we enter? Is it because we're entering into the treasures of Christ? It's, it's symbolic and real because you, the, the, the real physical doors, you're entering into a church, you're entering at a period of great grace, this special holy year. Also, and importantly enough, the, uh, we call it a holy door because all of the materials that go into the making of the door, the hammers that they mm-hmm. tap on the door to open it, and then the, the tools they use to close it, they're all blessed. They're all blessed with holy water. So. Mm-hmm. So uh, holy in many, many senses, mm-hmm. you know, entering a building, entering a holy mm-hmm. year and through a blessed door. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sounds like the only door that will be more important to enter is the gates of heaven, right? That's it, the <laughs> maybe, pearly gates. Yes, exactly. Maybe, maybe, Not bronze, but may, pearly. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe this uh, holy door is a little pre, prefiguring or symbol sure. of the great door of heaven to, oh, that we want to enter. You know, I always tell people, look, 
you can get your name in a book. I said, but the book you got to get your name in is the book of life. <laughs> I said, yeah. because everybody who gets their name in it has, a, has made it to heaven, you know. And uh, so, so that this year is uh, so good. I know I've gotten the opportunity to go through the Holy Door at St. Patrick's Cathedral. Oh, good. And I uh, want to encourage everybody, if you haven't gone yet, you know, to go because there are many indulgences and graces that uh, And I'll that be come. doing that in New York, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right, right. Well, well, Joan, we're going to take a little break now, okay? We'll be right back. We've got so much more interesting things to, do, to share with you, and uh, we've got Joan here to tell us a lot about these things. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Sunday Night Time. I'm Father Andrew Apostoli, your host for today's program. And our very special guest is uh, Joan, Joan Lewis, who is EWTN's Rome Bureau uh, Chief. Exactly. Okay. You got it. And author of this beautiful book, A Holy Year in Rome, subtitled The Complete Pilgrim's Guide for the Jubilee of Mercy. Uh, Joan, one of the things we wanted to talk about, you, which you spend a good time on your book, are the basilicas in Rome. What is a basilica? What exactly? Actually, the, uh, the name basilica comes from a Greek word, basileoika, and it means a royal building or a royal household. And it really was a specific type of building that only in the early centuries of the church did it refer to actually a specific structure for a church, which meant an apse, <clears throat> which is the portion of a church exactly opposite where you where you enter, the furthest part away from you, and then a nave, which is an aisle. The nave is the central aisle, and then you'd have either two or four side aisles. And if you had that many side aisles, you always had columns. So it was a specific um, architectural structure. And today, actually, basilica is a term used for eminent churches, whether or not they fit that particular architectural style. Uh, there's major basilicas, there's minor basilicas, and then the seven, the, I write about the seven basilicas in Rome, which over the years have become the traditional pilgrims' basilicas. You want to mm -hmm. go to these, if nothing else, as a pilgrim. Now, four of them are papal basilicas. So we have obviously St. Peter's, St. Paul's Outside the Walls, St. John Lateran, and St. Mary Major. And interestingly enough about St. John Lateran, it's a basilica cathedral. The cathedral coming from the word cathedra, which is in my big glossary of terms, yes. which people need to travel, um, whether the cathedral's in Rome or, or in New York. So coming from the word cathedra, which means chair, which is the seat of teaching of the local bishop, all right? The Cathedral of Rome, the Bishop of Rome, is the Pope. Mm -hmm. So he has to have a cathedral church, and in Rome it's St. John Lateran. And actually that name comes from a family, I think the third or so century, fourth century, the Lateranensi family. Um, so those basilicas, up until I think it was the second year of Pope Benedict's reign, they were known as patriarchal basilicas. Because one of the many titles that popes had was Patriarch of the West. And Benedict, very much like John Paul and also like Francis, his successor, Benedict always was striving to, to promote ecumenism and the relations between the different Christian churches. And he felt at one point that maybe the title Patriarch of the West for the Pope, because the Pope being like number one among equals was kind of a problem for some of the uh, Christian churches, the Orthodox, and so forth. So Benedict did away with the title patriarchal, which means they had to go around to a lot of buildings and change the word patriarchal to papal. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in my first book, they were all patriarchal basilicas. Along comes Benedict. They are now papal basilicas. And then mm -hmm. the other three are um, St. Lawrence, the other three 
uh, come about uh, adding to the four, mm -hmm. making seven. The three non-papal are St. Lawrence um, outside the walls, the Holy Cross in Jerusalem, and then St. Sebastian, which is also catacombs. And Holy Cross in Jerusalem is just totally amazing. It, it has a specific relic room where you have the relics of the Passion, you have part of the True Cross, you have a nail, you have a finger from Doubting Thomas, mm. who said he would only believe if he could put his, his mm -hmm. fingers in Christ's wounds. Yeah. And then the board that was on the cross that said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Um, <clears throat> so that's a very, very special room. And actually, the first time I ever visited the church, they had the crossbar of the cross where St. Dismas, the good thief, was. Mm -hmm. And I did not find that on my last visit. And it was a day in which no one seemed to be around to answer my questions. So I see. I'll have to put something on my blog about when, when, I, when I learn about that. So those are the seven basilicas, four patriarchal, four papal, and then the other other three. And, and you asked me, uh, do the pilgrims have to visit all seven to obtain the jubilee indulgence? No, they don't. And it, basically the indulgence will come, and we'll talk about that in a minute, f from going through the holy door itself. So mm -hmm. three of those churches do not um, yep. have the, the, the papal uh, holy doors that mm -hmm. you go through. And um, so... Basilicas, there's hundreds of basilicas. So let me tell you something about St. Peter's. As you walk in to St. Peter's Basilica, um, now I think there's, there's two wood barriers that go all the way up to the front of the church. And pilgrims can walk on both sides, but generally not in the center. Some days they're there, some days they aren't. But in the center of the floor are bronze plaques and letters. They're probably three meters wide, maybe a couple inches high. And there are the names in Latin of other churches, other basilicas, cathedrals in the world. Mm. If they were put inside of St. Peter's, where would they fit? So if this was St. Peter's, the next biggest one, and it's marked in the floor, is St. Paul's in London. And then you go up and there's, there's either four or five churches in America that actually, if placed, you know, the little plaque gives By their St. name. Peter's. Yeah, if placed inside, that's how big they would be. So that's a fun thing to to see when you go to St. Yes, Peter's. Yes, I've seen that in the floors, yeah, yeah. as you're approaching, yeah. I think there's 33 of them now. Mm -hmm. and um, But of course, St. Peter's, you were asking me, like, did I have a favorite? And it's so hard to say, but first place, I live three blocks from St. Peter's Square. You see the dome from my living room mm -hmm. and, and dining room. It's spectacular at night. Mm -hmm. And um, this is the tomb of the first pope, of the Apostle Peter. That's, That's right. very, very special. Yeah. to me. And the scavi, um, in my book, as you know, Father, I go into uh, the catacombs. I don't explain, uh, go into anything in my book that people can't visit. So I, I bring you to Vatican City because mm -hmm. there's tours, the yeah. museums and the gardens and everything. I bring you to Castel Gandolfo because now it's possible to go out and visit the summer papal residence and the gardens, and I tell you how to do that. And then I, I bring you to the catacombs. But I think the catacombs par excellence are the scavi under St. Peter's. Sure. A yeah. And mm -hmm. um, this, it's a very small version of a catacomb. There's um, part pagan. There's some pagan tombs in there. Then there's Christian. And um, there are, it was a burial ground on what today some people call Vatican Hill, which is not one of the seven hills of Rome. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the, Scavi, these excavations were found in 1949 when they began to build, to go underground to build the proper support for a funeral monument for a pope. And it was a very weighty monument, so they wanted to, to have this Make great sure. foundation yep. and sure foundation. And as they were digging down, they came and saw graves, and they saw tombstones and portals over doors of, of you know, like bigger tombs. Mm. And, uh, hey, stop the work, folks. And they went and eventually discovered what seemed to be the burial place of, of St. Peter, many, many indications that this was St. Peter and... Over time, the bones were examined, and weren't there words like "Peter is here" or something? Oh, oh yes. Yeah, 
because in those days they had to bury him secretly. I mean, the Romans would have, you know, would put him to death on, you know, upside down on a cross. Sure. Uh, you know, sure, sure would have desecrated the uh, burial Well, and there were times when anything had to do with Christianity. You wanted to desecrate what was close, uh, you know, meant a lot to the Christians. I mean, you think of St. Helena. The mother, she was like 80 when she went to the Holy Land. She was the mm -hmm. mother of the first Christian Emperor Constantine. And so she, she went to the Holy Land, unearthed the, you know, the true cross, because at the time of Jesus' death and under certain emperors in this Holy Land part of their empire, um, they just wanted to do away with anything, raise it to the ground, bury it, break mm -hmm. it, you know, remove sure. it, hide it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, St. Helena wanted to protect all these monuments, and many she brought back to, whole, uh, to Rome. And the Holy Cross of Jerusalem Basilica is built over part of her home. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's another interesting reason to, to visit that church. Mm -hmm. But the scavi are definitely worth it. You can go on, and I tell people in my book, because I, I have a whole section, Tips for Tourists, um, I tell people about the scavi and if you're, I'd say four to five months out from your trip is when you want to begin to reserve. Okay. It's very, very small. They can only take groups of 15, so you don't get busloads of 50 tourists getting okay. off and going in. So they take groups of like 12 or 15 max, and just several times each day. And so many more people will request to see them than can. Yeah. But it's definitely worth it. You want to go to the Tomb of St. Peter. Sure, you start with the Why not? Start with the top. Yes, exa exactly. <laughs> <The Pope. laughs> exactly. So beautiful, beautiful to see. But go to the part of the book where I, I have tips for tourists. Because what I've done, I take the tourist information from a Vatican website. And um, phone numbers and fax numbers, email addresses for the Vatican museums, the garden tours, the dome, mm -hmm. going up to see the dome. But then, in each section, I add my own little tips. Yeah. You know, how to avoid long lines and, oh, that's and good. Uh, make sure you don't have any health problems yeah. to climb the 320 steps to the dome. Oh, to the dome, yeah. yeah. I was up there. I went up there. But I took an elevator, I think, partway up, don't you? Well, you can take an yeah. elevator up to the level where, where the statues are of Christ and his apostles, mm -hmm. um, up to the, like what they call the terrace level. Mm -hmm. Then you have to go up the winding staircase yeah. to... Created by Michelangelo, yeah. how they and there's one staircase up, just one person at a time, and then a separate staircase down. So, but you can't be halfway up and say, "I'm short of breath, I want to go home." Yeah. Um, it just doesn't work that way. No, you have to right. go all the way, or probably yeah. die trying. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. So that's why well. I say health advice. You know, have good lungs yeah. and, uh -huh. and good heart and, and good leg muscles. That's right. For that's sure. right, Joan. That's very practical advice. Oh yeah. You know, you because, have to have the practical, right? Yeah, because people are not going to know that. that that's you know. for sure, you know. And uh, uh, well, uh, um, so, so the Scavi are, are cat catacombs, but I do bring people mm -hmm. to, to the other catacombs. Mm -hmm. You have St. Callista, St. Sebastian. Uh, St. Sebastian, that's kind of a two for one because you get one of the seven pilgrim basilicas. It's a real small church, and you go inside on the left is the is the tomb of St. Sebastian. And, and then you go down into the deeper, wider um, catacombs. But to find out how they preserved people, how mm -hmm. they buried people. Yeah. And, and you know what? People loved to come uh, and have picnics around. The, a family would celebrate the life of a person yeah. by often having their Sunday or whatever meal down in the tomb area. Isn't that amazing? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah, I've been in those uh, catacombs there, you know. I was sharing with you that uh, a little humorous story. Uh, it happened uh, somewhere in uh, in the catacombs. Um, a an old woman was praying in the cemetery up above the catacombs and um, all of a sudden there were some seminarians who had gotten lost in the catacombs. And, and all of a sudden, they must have seen a little bit of light coming through. And one seminarian lifted it, you know, hoisted another seminarian up, and he's coming through. He's breaking the, the dirt apart and coming through. Well, this lady is praying by the tomb, the dead, and she sees these people coming out of the earth. She got hysterical, and she cried out, it's the resurrection of the dead. You know? <laughs> and, that, and, of course, they're in black, so... 
Yeah, yeah. they were in black. She yeah. thought they were lost souls. <laughs> oh my gosh! No, they thank God they were not. But uh, uh, but boy, that must have been an experience. Huh? Praying oh, for the I dead. Got probably passed out at the first <laughs> yeah. yes face I saw, or hands, or something else like that. But. No, the catacombs, I mean, that's all part of our church history. A mm -hmm. And they're far outside of the city because nobody could be buried, uh, well, Christian or otherwise. Nobody could be buried within the city of Rome. So the city might have been this big. The city obviously did grow over time as the empire mm -hmm. grew. Um, but then people were really buried, you know, far out, uh, mm -hmm. far outside of the city. Yeah. And then the catacombs were just, uh, it was just amazing how they could, dig some of the catacombs it's like we're on this level right now and if you look up 20 feet you're going to see what looks like shelves and um, the edicula and then the niches in which the bodies would be laid and, and in some where if a family had more money they would engrave a little a, a stone with the person's first name and last name mm -hmm. and age you know and yeah. there were sometimes children uh, obviously yeah. buried there too so yeah. Yeah. Uh, all part of our history Mm -hmm. you know. and, and many martyrs too, were they? Not? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So beautiful stories. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Like you say, a very rich part of our uh, history. I remember I was very moved going to the catacombs. Uh, we went to visit, uh, and I, I believe we were at the Saint Sebastian mm -hmm. one. There's another major and the one. the old Appian Way, probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, those uh, you hear of those. And St. Callistus, and I don't even remember all the names, but uh, mm -hmm. those are two of the most popular for, for visitors, to be mm -hmm. honest. And you can actually get city buses in Rome that bring you to, to the catacombs, the catacombs if, yeah. if you're not part of a 50-person you know, mm -hmm. group tour. Sure. So just just go on your own. Yeah. Fun it, places. It was, it was, it really uh, it kind of uh, enriches your sense of, you're, you're being a Christian. You know, I'm related to these men and women, uh, the ancient times, faithful Christians in the beginning, persecuted many of them, living in uh, pagan times, which sure. is kind of an inspiration for today. We're living in neo-pagan times yeah. where, you know, the difference someone said is that the pagans back at the time of the early church, they were always pagan. So, Encountering the Christians, it was something new. Unfortunately, today, a lot of our pagans are people who had been Christian and have yeah. abandoned that and so have less appreciation for Christianity because they have, in many cases, uh, forsaken it, you know. Just a whole new category of people to pray for. That's right. <laughs> you know. That's right. But another interesting thing about the catacombs, too, much like the, the homes of rich Roman patrician people, um, w before they had a church in every block or every square kilometer or something, um, the Christians would meet in the homes, a small home of a poorer mm -hmm. person couldn't accommodate. But you had your patrician families and families would gather around and you'd have maybe one of the early days, you'd have an apostle or disciple. And, and um, mass actually, the form of the mass has, uh, I think that we have today is, almost 100% what it was in like the third century. Mm -hmm. And um, so you'd have the prayer service, you'd have communion, and then sometimes they did move to the catacombs, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. but the, so the catacombs are in the book and Vatican City's in the book, mm -hmm. Castel Gandolfo. Yeah, that, say a little bit on that, please. Oh, that is definitely worth a visit. Castel mm -hmm. Gandolfo is the Vatican that we know, Vatican City, Rome, is 108.7 acres and uh, 44 hectares. And Casa Gandolfo is much bigger because it has a very active farm. It's about 140 some acres. Mm. And so it has your beautiful apostolic palace. Everything's on a smaller scale. So it's much more intimate, very more, you know, not bigger than life size, but life size. Mm -hmm. uh, magnificent gardens. And mm -hmm. there's actually part of the gardens. I, I've posted this on my blog. There's a small section of the papal gardens that was designed by Bernini, whom we think mm -hmm. of as an architect and, yeah. and, and so forth. He's right? the famous columns, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Bernini's colonnade, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have the gardens. And what there's a tour now on Saturdays. You can go... Uh, a short tour of the Vatican Museum is like an hour and a half. Then you tour Vatican City all the way over to the train station. 
The train takes you to Casta Gandolfo, a bus up to the palace, mm -hmm. and then you see a lot more of church history. Wow. So it's, it's an amazing way to spend a day. It's, it's great things, you know. But it's too bad Pope Francis doesn't enjoy taking vacation there. All of his predecessors did. Yeah. Benedict loved it. We know that's where he retired for a couple of months mm -hmm. yeah. before moving to the monastery. Yeah. So. And uh, Pope John Paul, I understand, spent all his summers there. Oh, I think he'd have moved the papacy there had it been, been allowed. He, he was a know. kind of outdoors person, But wasn't Francis he? says he, I yeah. don't know how to take yeah. vacation, so yeah. there's no way he'd mm -hmm. relax there. Well, one last thing we just might want to touch on, Joan. We're coming to close to the end, but you had, we were talking uh, during our break uh, about um, how the there'll be different days uh, dedicated to different groups. Right. Uh, you mentioned. Oh, yes. Just mention a few of them. Oh, we I think we should. In May, so. Jubilee for deacons. June, Jubilee for priests and for those ill and with disabilities. July, World Youth Day. September, interesting, they have a jubilee for workers on the same day that Mother Teresa is supposed to be, a uh, will be canonized, mm -hmm. September 4th. Then we have a jubilee for catechists and the last jubilee, uh, Marian, in October. And then November has a lot of feast days, but jubilee celebrations and the closing of the Holy Doors. Mm -hmm. So the Feast of Christ the King in November will be the last official event, closing of St. Peter's Holy Door. Wow. So great things to look forward to. Yeah. So Joan, thank you so much for giving us this book so people can get it, A Holy Year in Rome, The Complete Pilgrim's Guide for the Jubilee of Mercy. And we must spread this beautiful gift of God's mercy and encourage people. Well, Joan, we're going to have to end now with a little prayer and a blessing. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, you are the divine mercy. And uh, your apostle, St. Faustina, has proclaimed that message. And the Holy Father, your, your vicar on earth, has proclaimed the Jubilee Year of Mercy. May all our people take advantage to receive the mercy that will set them free to love you and to love one another. Uh, for your mercy endures forever. Amen. I bless all of you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're coming now to the end where we will make our little um, uh, little uh, request for support. But Joan, thank you so much for being on the program today. It's a, a great My one. My joy. Great one. Okay. Well, we come to that part in the program now where we make our appeal for the support of EWTN. You see how, uh, you know, a program like today with Joan, with her mentioning her book, so many people find out about it. So many people will know how rich this year of mercy is. And that can happen with the, you know, the medium of television sure. and all the other things that EWTN uh, uses as communication. So please support them. We need your prayers, but we need your financial support for as much as you can, you know, whatever you can afford to help this beautiful work go. You're participating in the new evangelization. God will reward you. God love you all now. Thank <laughs> you.